Welcome to another Tech Tuesday with the IET Toronto Local Network. This is part of our online event series, which happens the first Tuesday of every month. Today's topic is in the realm of manufacturing engineering with a lean product development and a case study between Jaguar and Land Rover. And with that brief introduction, I'm going to switch straight over to our speaker. And of uh, my uh, career path, a little bit about myself, I've been the that I've, uh, I've worked my way backward from the value chain. I worked in manufacturing first uh, after I did my mechanical and uh, manufacturing degree. Um, I worked in the uh, Ronnie Foundry and Forging Plant in uh, Greece. Um, then uh, I joined a company called John Brown Automation in Coventry and uh, was working on designing automation systems there. Uh, and uh, there I came across uh, something that uh, intrigued me, which was uh, if you really wanted to improve manufacturing and uh, how you do business there, you actually needed to get the design stage sorted because uh, at that time automation was being uh, done and you couldn't automate anything unless you touched the design uh, because nothing would fit. Uh, it, it wasn't possible to do it. Uh, a lot of attempts were made and they were quite uh, faced a lot of failures. So I got interested in the field of uh, designing design systems and uh, started working there. Uh, our company was taken over, John Brown Automation as it was called, was taken over by a company called Harlan Simon Automation Systems and they had a lot of software uh, development across the globe. And the chairman uh, went and set up this company in uh, Luxembourg and I don't know what deal he had done anyway. The banks didn't like it so they pulled the plug. Uh, and within six weeks, I helped sell the company to another one called Schenk, uh, which made balancing machines and uh, other things. That was six weeks, probably the most intensive learning period uh, in business for me. Um, after which, uh, uh, I decided uh, this was a bit uh, hairy. Uh, so I joined uh, Warwick University to set up the product development and design center there. Uh, about seven years I worked there, and then uh, I worked a lot with the automotive companies there, including BMWs and others. Uh, and then um, once I'd done that, uh, they they thought uh, maybe one or two of the guys that I worked with thought eh, he's, he knows a few things. Let's let's see if he wants to come and join us. So I joined Ford Motor Company and went to America to set up the product design and uh, concept centers for the, their Lincoln and Mercury brands. So I ended up in Detroit. Thought, well, this is not very nice, uh, and uh, thought uh, convinced the company to set up a design and concept center in California. Uh, we took out a whole bunch of uh, engineers and designers there, so very interesting people, and uh, set up a whole new venture there. Study is still going on, although at the time I thought California isn't for me it's either. I'm, I want to go back to Coventry, uh, so I moved back to Coventry and joined the. the section of Ford Motor Company which is called PAG and I worked out of uh, Land Rover's facilities uh, and uh, basically uh, concentrated on the product design and uh, operations uh, for Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo and uh, uh, Aston then. Aston is a bit different. Uh, Ford by the way owns uh, all sorts of companies including at one point Hertz, uh, Ford Credit, a whole list of six pages worth of companies I'm sure uh, they're still going and uh, at various points they want various things. Of course that gives you a lot of monopolistic problems that we talked about over the break then. Um, my work there in Jaguar Land Rover particularly over the last three years has been concentrated on introducing lean practices which, uh, which are innovations that Toyota has done in the field of manufacturing into uh, product development. Uh, I mean, talked to some uh, quite high ranking guys at Toyota and, and they were telling me you're a bit silly trying to do this in product development. It's, it doesn't really make sense in product development. But uh, Ford's uh, structural business formula 
is that you should be spending about 5% of your turnover on product development. And product development for Ford includes research, includes design, and includes all the engineering and productionization. Uh, so about 5% of the turnover uh, was there. When I joined Jaguar Land Rover as a business unit, they were two separate companies, and we tried to bring the uh, things together. And I'll talk about what we've done there. But about two weeks ago, I, uh, I joined uh, business school in uh, Nottingham to, to actually go and do this for other companies as well. And uh, do them. so maybe I'll give you my card later on. So a bit of a checkered history. But basically, I've moved all the way upstream. And uh, that's been quite an interesting thing. So I'll talk about Jaguar and Rubin plants and businesses, tell you where they are, what they do. And the environment of the automotive business, it's a very old business uh, compared to uh, here's Packard and others, uh, like it's ancient really in terms of industrial terms. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about the complexities that we have and the performance metrics, how did we go about this, what are we talking about, what is lean, and the product development capability as a whole. So <clears throat> the plants where we do manufacturing are in Hellwood, Castle Bromwich, Solihull. And uh, you have, obviously, Ford Enterprise is larger than this, and it includes Volvo and other things as well. So there are centers in London, Downtown, uh, and, of course, Bridge End, where we make engines. And uh, there are two product development centers, in Gaydon, which is off the M40, and in Coventry, where uh, we have a center. 2,000 people in each site operating as a single unit. <coughs> About the same amount, 4,000 people also uh, work for Volvo, and about the 4,000 work for uh, Ford's product development in Europe, which is American Nick and Dalton. And these are associated to each other. They're not completely separate from each other, because it makes sense to share parts, although you, know, you don't want to see your uh, Ford parts on a Jaguar. Uh, but uh, you, know, you do get to see economies of scale that you can use there. The competitive environment for car business, because it's been around over 100 years, it's extremely difficult. Every year, there are 20 million more uh, units possible to make than people buy. So the total volume of cars sold, vehicles sold, is about 40 million a year. Uh, the capacity is about 60, and still people are putting capacity in. Toyotas are putting capacity in the US, there are countries, new countries coming into play, and they are putting capacity in. Uh, all sorts of people are putting capacity in, and some of the older companies are taking capacity out. But that means it's an extremely competitive market. The new entrants, as I mentioned, and the market itself is in a fragmented stage. I think uh, Matthias talked about it earlier uh, this morning. The market, even for mobile phones, it is fragmenting, but for us, it's been fragmenting for a very long time, and you're getting different configurations, different uh, segments in different countries. So you can't sell what you make here in France. You can't sell what you make here in Brazil. You can't sell what you make here in different. Uh, they all have to be somehow modified, and everybody has to do some different uh, legislative actions and things like that. Customers are also extremely sophisticated. When they part with uh, thousands of pounds or dollars, they are uh, very choosy. They want to get the best for their uh, value, value for money that they, they pay. So that's quite a competitive market. And they know everything uh, that's out there. And every six months, somebody puts something new out in the market and out outdates yours. As I mentioned, there's a whole host of legislation that you have to go through as well. Uh, for example, uh, the European legislation is different from the US. Every market you enter, it's got to be satisfying its own homologation. And uh, companies like Jaguar and Land Rover uh, will uh, introduce their products globally. So they don't play in, uh, for example, the American market only, or just the European market like Peugeot, Citroen, etc. They play globally. So they, every market has a cost of entry. A lot of work is done in order to get into and of course, all these new technologies that everybody dreams up every minute, the customer wants. So uh, there is a big dilemma for uh, companies like Jaguar and Land Rover. 
just to graphically illustrate that the amount of features and the technology that uh, goes into making the car and the variety that it produces is on an upward scale. Uh, people are wanting more and more features in. In fact, Jaguar and Land Rover owns more software code than Microsoft. Uh, uh, now, I don't know whether they are uh, more efficient <laughs> or uh, our engineers have been doing things that they're not telling anybody else about, uh, but uh, the engineering, the electrical engineering department in Jaguar and Land Rover, which is uh, uh, operating software and control systems and things like that, uh, is the biggest department now. It used to be powertrain where uh, you made the engines, but they are the, they are the biggest now. And uh, if you look at the IWE magazines, you'll see their uh, recruitment adverts there uh, for electrical engineers more than anything else. Of course, there is no part of a car that doesn't have some sort of technology in terms of uh, uh, software technology or hard, uh, electronic technology that uh, goes into it. I don't know of any part that doesn't have some sort of interaction. The body systems, all the interior systems, the seat, uh, front seat for a Jaguar will have at least eight electrical motors in it, all of them controlled, uh, and you know, different ways of uh, arranging your seating position. Uh, so there's very, very complicated products nowadays. And of course, uh, features increase at a different uh, rate. So when you're introducing new uh, mobile features, the customer says, well, I want it in my car right away, now. Although our cycle times of product development are a bit longer than uh, those. At the same time, then, we have the product life cycles decreasing because of the fragmentations, the batch sizes we make are decreasing, and the repeat orders, definitely. People are uh, not loyal to a brand anymore. They take a brand, and uh, unless uh, by some uh, magic method you can keep him, they are very, very disloyal. They will walk and buy something else very easily and uh, work very hard to keep them there. And all these marketing guys that work there, all five, six hundred of them tell us they're, they're trying to keep them, but I don't know what that, what's happening to them. So the mission of uh, the product development unit, if you like, for uh, Jaguar and Land Rover is summed up in this, word, uh, in this uh, phrase, more great products faster. So we have to make the uh, things faster, we reduce the lead time. So I'll, I'll touch on the faster a bit at the end of it, and we want more products. At any one time, there are about 35 different car programs that are taking place at Jaguar and Land Rover. And that's partly due to the lineage. So I'll let, let you see where it has come. And as you can see, um, a little bit about British industry, really. British uh, car making is actually very close to its peak in the 70s. So there are nearly uh, 1.7 million units made out of Britain now. And that peak, I think it hit 1.8 million in the 70s. So although they're not British owned, they are actually British car industry is quite healthy. And particularly in um, diesel engines, there's a big niche in diesel engines. It, we export diesel engines out of uh, Britain to Europe and everywhere else. Uh, but as you can see on the Ford's uh, ownership, Jaguar has done quite a lot of product introduction as well. And there are various variants of these that uh, I have drawn up there. Similarly, Land Rover, which has a more checkered history than Jaguar, because Jaguar separated from Land Rover some time back when they were under VL, and then uh, came back together again a few years later. It's a, it's a funny business. But uh, there are uh, nine product lines, uh, you know, X-Type, S-Type, XJ, XK for Jaguar, and we have the Freelander, the uh, Defender, and uh, we have to discover it, the Range Rover Sport and the Range Rover itself uh, for Land Rover. To service this, it takes about a third of product development energy just to keep them legal. Uh, in all these markets, legislation changes. Just to keep them in terms of their engine technology legal, it takes about one third of the 4,000 people we're talking about. Uh, so it is actually quite difficult to maintain and keep yourself in the market in the first place. As I said, there are about 35 programs happening at the same time, and they are of different sizes. Uh, when we introduced the uh, Discovery and the Range Rover Sport, that was a 
entirely ground up project, so a complete new platform, everything new for that. But at the other end, we will have programs that will just do a legal uh, modification to an engine in, the, for example, an X type in the US market. Uh, so there are various sizes, but most of the major programs, we make about two cars, introduce uh, two new cars to the market every two years. Uh, not saying a car a year, because it doesn't always happen. So it's about two cars every two years. So you might have uh, two cars happening in the same year. The process is that uh, the lead times for uh, introduction of product development of both of these brands, when we brought them together in uh, 2002, were uncompetitive, are still uncompetitive uh, with the best in the world. But we've done a lot of work in changing that. And we had enormous amount of heritage. You can call it legacy, you can call it heritage, but it basically anchors you down and suffocates you, especially if you're trying to talk to each other, change parts with each other. You know, uh, We had 18 different engine variants on the Jaguars. Uh, Land Rover was owned by BMW at one point, so it was a BMW engine, then there was a Honda engine, then there was another engine, God knows who made that, and there was uh, all sorts of variants. Very difficult to maintain all these, as I, as I was mentioning. So also, enormous amount of complexity of parts and the processes that went to make these existed then. In our world, uh, we sort of, when we brought Jaguar Land Rover together, just our design systems, uh, that uh, the way we design things and communicate and uh, archive them and all this, gave us all this complexity, of course, you know, there's pressure to commonize parts. Like you don't want to have the different screws from Volvo. Why should you? Or Ford of Europe. Why should you? It does not make sense. So for us, there were 48 different scenarios. For every engineer, there were 48 different ways of designing a part, releasing it into bill of material system, archiving it, and all sorts of other things. It's a crazy system. So most companies will know one way of doing this. Uh, but uh, it gave us enormous amount of problems. I remember when I first uh, went to that role about three years ago, uh, it was taking 30 days to take a CAD part from uh, Land Rover and make it visible to Volvo. 30 days. It was incredible. They were saying that let's get rid of all these computers and just send them the papers. Uh, much, much, much easier. Uh, but uh, obviously we're not going to do that. So what was our target? We thought we are very uncompetitive, so we wanted to reduce the product development lead times on average by 12 months, depending on how big the program is. And that probably a ground up project would take about 45, 46 months. Uh, but uh, we wanted to reduce that to, to something in the order of three years rather than four years. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do. Rid also, at the same time, we wanted to reduce the cost of development because when you're developing these uh, things, you do have an enormous amount of cost going into them. And the companies talk about 2%, 3%, 5% margins, not talking about uh, 30s and 40s. This car business is very difficult business to make money out of. Uh, okay, I better go fast. Got excited about this. So, as you can see, there were a lot of things that we wanted to do. So what did we do? We put together some joined up thinking, if you like, from the corporation. So uh, our uh, product development vision, if you like, which we pictorially represent, translates it to a business plan that is five year long, and every year it gets updated. And that cascades to lines and lines of actions which uh, go into the improvement cycle. And we monitor that there's a closed loop there that relates back to the company's uh, overall things. So what we went about uh, putting together, in Halewood, in uh, Jaguar's x plant, we had the best plant Ford has. And uh, when they transferred that from Ford to Jaguar, uh, there was a whole revolution that took place there and made that plant lean. Uh, of course, it's much leaner, three, four years ahead of the product development. Uh, so we consider that in Ford's world as lean. And therefore, we said, what are we going to do? We're going to do the same sort of thing in uh, 
Jaguar Land Rover's product development. When we combined them, it was about 10% of the turnover, the cost. Uh, today, it's about 5%. Uh, so it was about the lowest cost way of doing things. And that uh, does not mean that we cut out uh, things that we shouldn't be doing. It meant that it's being much, much more streamlined. What is the actually adding value? Uh, it went about, about how we have a value stream that uh, the steps that take place in order to get us to the car and uh, we wanted to create a flow of flow system that everything flows through this like a production line almost itself and uh, we put a pool system in the aim of this entire system together is to reach perfection i.e. you don't wait at all it just flows like a pipe for all the activity that has taken place but uh, we realize that that's going to be impossible to reach and by the time we do that, uh, that. so lean was about maximizing the value add uh, and reducing the waste all the time and in everywhere within PD. Uh, for that, we needed to see the waste. It's very difficult to see the waste in uh, research and product development. Uh, my personal view is that actually uh, you do need to load product development activity no more than 70-80% of utilization because uh, I think it was Peter in the morning who was talking about uh, thinking time. The thinking time is extremely important in this field. Uh, this is uh, an invisible thing. Nobody can see it. Uh, and when they see it, some people think it is a uh, waste. But that thinking time is crucial for product development. So uh, I think all the attempts that I have seen for maximizing utilization of people and uh, product development capability, Whenever it's gone over 70, 80 percentage mark, it started to fail because people don't have that uh, capacity to cooperate with each other. And a lot of this takes uh, the cooperation of various other people and the goodwill of other people to make the flow happen. I don't know whether you've seen uh, the lean uh, waste uh, that happened in manufacturing, but we created something for the product development environment, which wasn't about inventory and things like that, or that was uh, not uh, understood by uh, engineers and designers. So waiting, overproduction, rework, unnecessary motion, processing too much information. We obviously have the capability to do that now. Uh, and uh, having uh, extra work that is not necessary, reducing and wasting talent, very, very important point uh, there we consider as a waste and uh, moving things around obviously is also a waste. And we learned from our Hailwood plan that we must do this with proper data and quite a lot of discipline. So we started in uh, areas that we thought is easiest for us. Just to tell you though, Lean for me is about not just doing what you do normally, but always thinking about improving it. And that happens at all levels of the company. You are lean when everybody is doing this all the time. And uh, that, that is an important mass message for me. It's also very easy for us to miss some hidden outputs out of product development. Uh, so we did map who our customers are. And most of the time we are within ourselves. But uh, the capability of product development itself is something that is created by product development activity. So it's a bit uh, strange, but you know, if you're a company like Ford, you can go and buy this capability from outside. So creating that rapid capability itself has value. IPR, uh, the final solution to the brand also is done in product development. So the question of what we make and how we make it, it's all done there. And obviously, it generates a lot of technology. It generates a lot of other things as well. So we went about, I'll do this quickly, uh, putting a framework together so people could understand it easy. And uh, we did, uh, basing on the tools and training that we gave people, we put uh, to uh, make our processes leaner, the facilities leaner, and the programs themselves uh, leaner, and the leadership activities to be there as well. So this is an example of our release processes. We have two different ones. 
uh, I won't show you all these little uh, bits you see in between those process steps are waste uh, and uh, we modify those in order to so map everything in order to modify them and make them better and streamlined. As you can see though, we have actually quite different processes in Jaguar and Land Rover as well. Uh, test facilities, for example, similarly we value stream map them and put them at a better stage. And uh, even the facilities that now we are making, the new facilities, such as the climatic uh, facility we put together, and it's gone in now, uh, was uh, designed to reduce the amount of waste in it from the beginning. We also put within the, every program as a budget, uh, and you know, you've got X number of million dollars to make uh, a car or a program to execution. And that, what that meant was that uh, uh, we used lean supplier value stream mapping in order to reduce the amount of cost in our supply chain as well as our, our uh, own processes as well. So just roughly to give you uh, what uh, were our targets to the end of 2006, I mean, uh, we're targeting about deploying about 80%, we've done about 60%, but as of last month, uh, value stream map is not quite near its target. But it's not a bad uh, figure to have uh, uh, saved uh, out of programs. And business improvement activities, about 80 of them. These are major processes in product development. And there are hundreds of them, but uh, we've got about 80 there. And trained about 1,800 people out of the 2,000 target. I think those are on target. Just tell you a couple of things about uh, capability. Product development capability is about how fast you can do things, how many of them you can do through this system, and how much does it cost you to do this? That is the question of capability for product development. And if you look at it, the cost structure that goes there, it is predominantly time related, and that's lead time related. So actually, lead time is the critical measure in product development. Um, and if you look at it from a compressing lead time point of view, you're uh, measuring the performance of how much you compress the lead time, and then you can measure the rate of compression that you are doing. And at uh, uh, various levels, you gain your advantage from there. Your operational excellence in product development is actually your company's future uh, competitiveness. Because without product development working properly, You'll be out of business very shortly in these rapid markets. I don't think Nokia, Sony, any one of these companies can actually stay in business for more than a year or so if they stop their product development activity now. Uh, so that capability is extremely important. Something that uh, you were mentioning earlier in the session before was that uh, some of these technologies then bring us some capabilities that the institutions don't think about. And uh, I've tried to depict that. We've done the lean work that is the bottom section there. You make some process changes, major process changes, which I'll show uh, for a second. And there are some technological changes that enables, for example, uh, in terms of uh, rapid prototyping technology or technologies that are allowing us to do parametric design and other things. But then there are some completely environmental changes that happen. And somebody comes along and says, actually, you don't need a wheel you can do something else about this uh, and get rid of a whole layer of complexity for us. Just as a matter of process change, lean gave us a lot of advantage, but uh, in order to reduce the lead time drastically, we went about setting a uh, complete restructuring of the product development system that existed in uh, Jaguar Land Rover. And we created something which is about 12 months shorter uh, by using some uh, common sense more, more, more than not. Uh, but they were the main, I won't go through them, but basically by front-loading and uh, making sure that the design, build, test cycle uh, is as much as virtual as possible. And also, uh, we don't uh, overlap them so much, because overlapping them too much, uh, you're uh, generating a lot of waste into the system. So, just to try and sum up, two and a half years ago, we two and a half, three years ago now, we decided to go on to the path of this uh, creating lean for product development. It's not been a straightforward. It's required a completely different way of thinking in uh, product development. And actually, 
uh, one of the previous speakers talked about the management's uh, role on this. Uh, and uh, I want to mention that 80% rule. Uh, that's very important not to cross, because if you cross that, you're going to start failing. There is a queue that will develop, and uh, some people will uh, talk about traffic jams and things like that. There will be a queue developing in your flow that uh, will uh, not be able to overcome unless you go well below it. But overall, it gives the company a strategic advantage because reducing lead times uh, by 12 months, I estimate that has given Jaguar and Land Rover uh, something in the order of $10 billion worth of benefit in the next uh, three to four years. Part of that is in cost. Part of that is in... Uh, uh, gained revenue. So if you're late to the market on average in Jaguar Land Rover world by one month, you lose about 60, 70 million dollars worth of uh, sales. Uh, if you are uh, obviously earlier, uh, you gain a difference. Uh, you don't gain the 60 million, you gain a difference of what you would have sold otherwise. So I estimate that put everything together, that's worth about 10 billion dollars over a four-year, three-year period. It's an estimate, but it's a massive advantage in terms of uh, the company's profitability and growth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you found this interesting, don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel down below so you get notified when we release a brand new video. And of course, check us out on IET Engineering Communities to find out what other events we have coming up, like our festive dinner on the 9th of December. And finally, thanks to IET TV for providing the content for tonight's webinar.